Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord? Some of you are ready. How about the rest of you? How many of you are ready to hear the word of the Lord? Amen. I got so disappointed last week, and I, I knew that there wasn't time to preach this message. Uh, and I understood that it wasn't God's timing. Not very often do I say, well, we've come to the end of the service and there's no time to preach. Mostly because I believe in the authority of the Word of God and the fact it belongs in the worship service. But several of you, even after the service, said, uh, texted me and, and said, Gordon, there were so many sermons in that service before it got to the time where you were to preach that it was marvelous. And uh, so God knows what he's doing. My only prayer is that I'll step out of the way and let him do what he wants to do. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we rest in you. We relax in you. We understand the authority that you have for us. Lord, you have a word now that is, is to come to us that will set us free. It will help us to understand how to adjust our attitudes for life itself so that we may become victors and not victims of the circumstances of life. We thank you, Father, for all that you're going to speak to us. Give us hearts to obey. Be glorified through all that is said as your spirit teaches us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Are you a victim or a victor? Victor, 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 victor. See, my name's not Victor. No, are you a victor? <laughs> uh, how many of you at times during the week struggle with that issue? Come on, be honest. Okay. Sometimes we forget who we are. Look me square in the eye and let me tell you, you're a king's kid. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you are, by your very nature and by the calling of God, awesome people. And don't let anybody tell you different. Private message going out there. I don't care how spiritual or godly people look. If they start telling you you're awful, you're this, you're that, they've missed God. Because they're standing in direct conflict to what God says about you. You're the apple of his eye. He loves you. And he's given you authority over life. You are a king priest. I don't think I've ever preached that here. I had a fresh revelation of that this week. We are king priests. If somebody asks you, well, what's your occupation? You say, oh, well, I'm a king priest. As they look at you and say, what in the world is a king priest? How many of you want to know what a king priest is? Okay. All right. What's our daily attitude? You know your attitude determines your altitude? how far you're going to go in life, how high you're going to go. As we face life on a day-to-day -day basis, do we feel like a victim or do we feel like a victor? What's our daily attitude? Do I want to thrive or am I satisfied just to survive, just to cope, just to get through one more week? Thrive. You were destined for the throne of God. It's a wonderful little paperback book put out by, I think it's uh, Christian Literature Crusade back in the 60s. And it was simply called Destined for the Throne. His, uh, the man's name was Bill Heimer. Not Bill Heimer, but Bill Heimer. That was his last name. Marvelous book. And it talks about our authority in Christ. Don't satisfy for anything. Don't be satisfied or settle for anything less than what God has for you within his life within your life. Our, the choice is ours. We've got to adjust our thinking. We need a checkup from the neck up. Any of you ever need a checkup from the neck up? That's a phrase from uh, one of my favorite speakers. I'm trying to think of it. 
he did Born to Win. I forget what his name was, but uh, Zig Ziglar. Zig Ziglar. Marvelous teachings. If you ever get to hear Zig Ziglar, I just love him. Baptist Sunday school teacher his whole life and uh, just produced some great stuff. Hi, uh, wonderful Christian motivator. Uh, we were literally destined for the throne, born to win. You're awesome. This is not me pumping you up. This is the Word of God. This is what God says about you. Before you make your choice, whether to be a victim or a victor, in every situation of life, stop and look at the promises of God. Here's the promise of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You. Say, that's me. You are a chosen generation a chosen group of people chosen by whom none other than God himself not chosen by a creation another person but chosen by the creator God himself you are a chosen he's talking to the church here we're not talking about membership within the church we're talking about those who are born again those who are saved if you're here today and you haven't received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you haven't admitted you're a sinner like the preacher is, then you need to do that. You need to just stop and say, Lord Jesus, you're the end of my sinning. You're the Savior. You're the deliverer from me, from myself, from sin, and from Satan. And I receive you as such, and I live out of you. But the majority of you here, if not all of you here, have been born again. You are saved. And so we look at that, and you qualify in this passage as Peter writes to the church. And he, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, says, You are a chosen generation. I'm going to skip over the second one there and go down to the rest and come back to the, to the second one. You are a holy nation. America started out as a holy nation. It was a nation founded on Christian principles. It is now a post-Christian nation. So America is not what God is talking about there. He's talking about a nation of holy people. That's you. That's you. He says... You are God's own special people. If you want, you can put your thumb under your lapel and say, I'm special. Because you are. You are God's special people. Well, what does it mean you're special? Special means not like the rest, doesn't it? Different, unique. Listen to what God says here in the middle of this. Go back up to that second one. And it says what? You are a royal, stop there for just a minute. What does royal mean? Kings and queens. Royalty assumes that there's a king. Okay, you are a royal priesthood. Just correct your theology here. He's not talking about preachers. I get the same authority you get from God. The exact same authority. We tended in the previous generations in America to hold up our preachers as, as being something unique and different. And certainly we have a calling and a gifting from God, but let me tell you, the stronger word in the Greek in the New Testament is the word laos, from which we get the word laity or the church membership. The, not paper membership, but literally those who are born again and therefore members of the church. That's you. It's not the kleros, the clergy. It's the laos, the laity of the church. You folks who are awesomely unique. You are a royal priest under the Most High God. Do you know that in all of God's history with mankind, he never called any other group king priests? 
He didn't call anybody in Israel a king priest. And he certainly didn't say about Israel that they were a nation of king priests. He reserved that term for the church, for you and for me. I say, well, where does that come from? Where is that? First of all, do you all know we're supposed to follow Jesus' example? If you want to know how to live, then just follow Jesus' example. Does that make sense? Do what he does. Imitate Christ, obviously by the strength of the Spirit, not in your flesh. But imitate Christ. All right, so who is Jesus? We see Jesus in the Old Testament. I hope you know that Jesus was in the Old Testament. Theologians call it a... Uh, let me see if I can go... A, a uh, theanthropic appearance. Theos, meaning God, and anthropos, meaning man. An appearance of the God-man, Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament. There were many of them. But one of them is a man by the name of Melchizedek. Any of you ever heard of Melchizedek? That's Christ appearing in the Old Testament. And listen to what it says. Then, this is Genesis 14, first book of the Bible. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem. So what do we know about Melchizedek? He's a king. And when you're a king, are you the king of England? Are you the, the king of Uzbekistan? Where, who are you the king of? In this case, he's the king of Salem. What do you see in the word Salem? It's the same root word as the word shalom. He's the king of peace. How many of you struggle to get peace every now and then? Come on. Jesus, the king of peace, lives within you. So the king of peace, Jesus, who is Melchizedek, he shows up as Melchizedek. There's no history of him anywhere else. He just appears in history. That's how we know it's Jesus. He just appears and then he's gone. And the New Testament talks about him as well, uh, having been in the Old Testament. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or shalom, or peace, brought forth what? Oh. Melchizedek brought to Abram, he wasn't Abraham yet. At that point in his life, his name was Abram. And he brought to him bread and wine. And you thought communion was only New Testament. He brought him bread and wine. What's one of the names of Jesus in the New Testament? Bread of heaven. Jesus was called the bread of heaven. Melchizedek, who is Jesus, brings bread and juice to Abraham. He brings him communion, foreshadowing the fact, and we had communion this morning, uh, and it's open to anybody at, at 9 o'clock. Uh, in the little blue room, although we had so many this morning, we may need to move. Uh, but uh, we have communion, and we served the bread and the wine, the juice, grape juice. And we understand what? The bread is Jesus' body broken for us. And the juice is his blood spilt out for us because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now, here's Jesus in the Old Testament coming to Abraham, who, by the way, was a man of faith. In fact, he's called the father of faith. And Jesus serves communion to Abram in the Old Testament. Now, how many of you ever saw that before? Okay. Now, it goes on to talk about Melchizedek, and it says, and he was also what? The priest, he was the king of Salem and the priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek was a king priest. Ooh. Everything Jesus is, you and I are supposed to be. King priests. 
Way back in Genesis, we see it coming. We're to follow Christ's example. Revelation chapter 1, you say, Gord, you're just making that up. No. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. This is God talking about the church that is standing around heaven. And listen to what he says. Now he, referring to Christ, who in the Old Testament appeared as Melchizedek, he, Christ, made us what? Oh, he made us kings and priests. Hmm. In a minute, you're going to find out why that's significant. Kings and priests or servants unto God, referring to Jesus Christ, and to his Father, to God the Father. And it doesn't say unto them, God the Son and God the Father, because they are one. It says, and unto him, so we believe in the what? It starts with T, ends with Y. Trinity. Trinity. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So it says, And unto him be glory and dominion, rule forever and ever. Amen. God gives to you as a king priest a double portion of authority to speak into your situation, to look at your your family, your uh, finances, to look at your church, and to begin to speak the life of Christ into it by faith. And you do so with the authority of a king and a priest. What areas of your life should you speak as a king priest? All of them. Yeah, what she said. <laughs> she said he wants every area of my life. We begin as king priests to take the authority of God and speak into every area of our life. Every one of us, starting with your pastor, sometimes during the week we struggle. Oh, Lord, this weather's going to get me down. Oh, Lord, our finances. Oh, Lord, our family, our kids, our parents. Uh, you know. They're, they're, they're about to wear me out, as they say in the South. They're going to wear me out. Watch what you say. You are king priest, and you will either speak life into your situation, or you will speak death into your situation. Be careful what you say. King priests in Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 4 says, Where the... And we're talking all, all year long about the Word, taking the Word into your world. Where the Word of the King is, there is what? Okay, you're a what? King. You have what with your Word? We spend our time praying things that should never be prayed. Because we're praying what God already said he'd do. And then we get mad at God because he doesn't do it when we're sitting there wondering, God, are you going to do this? I don't know. Should I trust God to do this? God says, I spoke it 2,000 years ago. Speak it out. Speak it into that situation in your life. Look at what I've given you from the word and begin to speak it into your family, your kids. I'm doing that all the time into your finances, into your church. Where the word of the king is, there is power. Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 5 says, where the word of the priest is, you're a what? I only heard a couple of you. You're a what? You're a priest. Revelation 1, 6 says so, that he made you King priests, king priests. The word of, where the word of the Lord is, or by the word of the Lord, every controversy, every controversy. You have any controversy in your life? <laughs> life is a controversy, isn't it? Okay. By the word of the priest, that's you. That's not me. That's I mean, it is me, but that's only because I'm a part of the church. 
not because I'm a pastor, by the word of the priest, every controversy and every assault against you, every assault against you shall be settled. So you speak with the king as authority and you speak with the priest to settle any disputes about you. Mm, I love that. <laughs> Kings are said to have a divine right. First thing I learned in world history was that when they talked about kings, they talked about the fact that kings had a divine right to rule. Now, by the way, they also have a divine responsibility. And often they'll harp on the divine right to rule, but forget the divine responsibility to rule justly, fairly, etc. Washington and Albany could remember that. You may have authority because it's been given to you, but that authority assumes a responsibility with it. Kings are said to have a divine right to speak and to rule and to reign over all of their subjects. Every area of your life is a subject. And you have the right given by God to speak the word of God and to speak the life of God into every situation within your house. Don't be speaking that negative stuff. Rule and reign as a king over your life. As priests, what does a priest do? He legally represents God to man and man to God. When I come on Sundays, I speak to you somewhat as a priest. Uh, I speak to you the life of God, the word of God. You hope and pray for me that that's all I speak is the word of God. Because priests are supposed to preach or speak the word of God because I represent God to you being mankind. But there are many times, not only on Sunday when we go through the pastoral prayer, but during the week when we pray for you and we represent man to God. We say, God, she's having surgery this week. And as a priest, we hold her up and say, God, let that surgery be perfect. Let that treatment be perfect. You say, well, I couldn't do that. I'm just me. No, no, no. You don't get it. You're a king priest. Uh, God said you are. You going to argue with God? <laughs> God said you're a king priest. Yeah, Barbara says, don't argue with God. You will lose. <laughs> Priests represent God to man, and they represent man to God. When you and I go out at the end of the service out into the world, we're supposed to represent God to all of mankind that we contact all week long. We need to learn to apply this king-priest authority to every area of our lives. Understand this secret. How do you do that? You do it by faith. Where faith is dominant, your fears, your fears will be dormant. Anybody here besides me struggle with fears? God needs for us to understand fear and faith cannot operate on the same plane. You cannot operate out of partial faith and partial fear. Either you're operating out of fear or you're operating out of faith. They don't coexist together ever. They are mutually exclusive. So you go in for surgery, what do you say? Before you go in, you say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the divine physician and you're going to superintend everything that happens to me in this surgery. Everything that happens to me. And I'm going to come out of this better because the divine healer, Jesus Christ, Jehovah Rapha, is going to go in with me and he will superintend everything the doctor does. So my faith is dominant. And when my faith is dominant, my fears are dormant. They'll die. On the other hand, if your fears are dominant, then your faith will be dormant because they are mutually exclusive. 
It isn't that we've somehow got to force God to bless us. God says, my blessing is out there. Take it by faith. But if we choose to operate in fear, then we negate what God has already promised to us. We deny what God has already promised to us. Which of these do you choose to live out of daily? Fear or faith? I can tell you right now that it will drastically change your whole life. Your destiny will be based on do you choose to operate out of fear or of faith. I promise you, terrible promise, you will have a miserable existence if you live in fear. If you think that you're a pauper in life's ex- uh, circumstances, you'll have a miserable existence. But if you operate in f- faith, you will be amazed at what God does in you, through you, and for you. Here's a heavy thought. When we choose to live in fear, it's not that we deny Christ, but we dethrone him, at least within our own lives. We dethrone him. We take away his authority, his power, because we say, well, God, I don't know if you can do this, God. What do you mean you don't know if, you, if God can do this? Of course he can do it. He's God. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Amen? Okay. When we choose to live in fear, we've not denied Christ as much as we have dethroned him. We've simply said, yeah, I believe in you, Lord, but you don't have any power. Because I'm me, there's really nothing you can do in my life to turn things around. Really? Your God is too small. Serve a larger God. Understand who God is. How sad that is. You see the two little caricatures there. One of them is Zing. I think much of the church, at least within America, is sleeping. They miss the whole point of God's word. He is alive and well and his word is powerful. And as a king priest, when you speak it, situations change. Because you say it in faith. Believing. And the church misses that and it sleeps through that. It says, oh Lord, Jesus, we pray that you do something. We don't know if you can, but we pray you do. Oh no, don't sleep through the promises of God. The other one is, oh my goodness, how sad that the church doesn't know it's king priests. It is sad if you don't know who you are. That's sad. You're not just a king's kid, but you are literally the child of God and have his authority. Do not fear the enemy. I love this. God reminded me of this. When the weakest Christian prays an expectant prayer, all of hell trembles. When you live in, bless you, when you live in faith, And you wake up in the morning, all of hell goes, "Uh uh-oh, she's awake. Uh Uh-oh, he's awake. Uh Oh, Hell shakes when you stand in faith. It rejoices and laughs when you live in fear. And the angels of heaven scratch their head and say, I don't understand this. They're the kids of God. And they act like they got nothing. They don't know who they are. How sad. How sad. I'm going to close with this. Read you a wonderful passage of scripture. It kind of summarizes everything that's there. Romans 8. We had a quote from Romans 8 this morning. Uh, this is Romans 8 starting with verse 28. And we're going to go through 39. And then we'll close in prayer. All of you know this one. And we know that all things work together for good. 
for those who are the called of God and love him, the called according to his purposes. For God for whom those, excuse me, those who God foreknew, he also predestined. In eternity past, God knew that he would call you to be his king priest, his kid. He foreknew that. And it said he also predestined you to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Are you getting that? Some of the black preachers say, are you picking up what I'm laying down? (laughs) You are predestined by God to be conformed to the image of who Jesus is. Whatever Jesus is, God said, I am predestining you to be just like Jesus. How many of you want to be just like Jesus? How many of you sometimes forget that you are just like Jesus because God said so? We need to stop snoozing. It's no wonder the Apostle Paul wrote, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. The church acts like it's dead. Mm. And it's alive. It's conformed to the image of Jesus. That Christ might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified... He also glorified. Do you notice there's not a place in there where it says that you and I did these things? Every one of those it says that God did those things. It's up to God to do them, and he has. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for me, for us, who can be against us? If God's for me, who can be against me? Nobody. Nobody. Mm. He who did not spare his own son, the Father gave up his own son for us, but gave him to us all, how will he not also give with him graciously all things to us? Now what falls in that category of all things? Are you sure? Yes. All things means all things. And this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. God the Father says, if I gave you my son, would I not give you all things? Else, is there anything you could need that if I gave you Jesus, I wouldn't give you this too? You know, come on, know how much I love you. Hmm. Who will bring any charge against those whom God hath chosen? Who dares? Who dares to speak against those whom God has chosen? Mm. It is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns Jesus Christ who died, but more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of the Father Uh, of God the Father, and is interceding for us, he's praying for us, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Who can separate you from God? Can the meanness of somebody's spirit? No. Can anything you do separate you from the love of God? God will not stop loving you no matter what you do. He's going to love you into the kingdom of God and keep you in it by his love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, shall hardship, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness, or danger, or the sword? Verse 37. No, in all these things we are what? More than conquerors. God said, I didn't just call you to be victors. I called you to be more than victors, more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present or the future, nothing in the future can separate you from Christ. Nothing. Nor anything else in all of creation. Gee, that's pretty comprehensive. 
nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You're a king priest. I'm a king priest. We need to believe it, speak like it, act like it. By the way, God is very gracious. And so we need to be gracious. Somebody comes against you who isn't gracious, you know it isn't God. God is gracious. Who are you anyway? What? King priests. Oh. Who do you think you are? King priests. Thank you. <laughs> You're getting it.